Uh, Sean, I'm just going to introduce you. Welcome. Sean Shu is a professor of English at the University of California, Davis, uh, and author of The Smell of Risk, Environmental Disparities and Olfactory Aesthetics, which will be published by NYU Press later this year. Um, so I wanted to start just by thanking Saskia, Clara, and everyone else who's been working so hard to coordinate this event. Um, and I'm just excited to be presenting at this forum. I've been following it for a while. As an academic, it's rare to come across a space where artists, perfumers, scholars, and scientists are in supportive conversation with each other. And I think this is something that really has distinguished this event and the community it's brought together. So thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to be sharing some work from my forthcoming book, which looks at the work of artists and writers who use smell to think about how inequality manifests in the air we breathe. Um, so there I could just footnote much of Clara's wonderful talk. Um, so how practices of atmospheric engineering, such as air filters, ventilation, and the siding of parks, freeways, and toxic dumps, differentiate human experience and bodies by dividing up the air itself. Because I'm interested in toxicity and disparity, I focus quite a bit on race and colonialism, and I hope that my talk will provoke some critical conversation about how to ethically confront the ways in which scent is already engaged with race and colonialism. So this is where I have to figure out how to advance slides and things like that. Um, oh, I think I just clicked on the next one, yeah. Um, okay, so Let's see, the point of departure for this talk is the idea of decolonizing the senses. Um, and the decolonial theorists Walter Mignolo and Rolando Vasquez write that decolonial aesthesis starts from the consciousness that the modern colonial project has implied not only control of the economy, the political and knowledge, but also control over the senses and perception. So really thinking about what to do about that and how to decolonize um, the way that we sense the world. Um, a little more conceptual background before I got started. So these are just some ideas that have oriented my thinking. Um, one is the idea of transcorporeality that's been introduced by the feminist materialist philosopher Stacey Alimo. Um, and that's really trying to center um, a model of human environmental relationship that's similar to what Clara talked about as enmeshment. So thinking about co-constitutive material and often biochemical exchanges between bodies and environments. Um, the other concept is the idea of racial atmosphere. So scholars um, like Renisa Mawani and Christina Sharp have been really working to rethink race in terms not only of the body, right? Um, so like the color of skin, for example, and other supposedly physical characteristics but also in terms of atmospheres, which would include both the kind of atmospheres that surround certain bodies, but also the way those atmospheres get into bodily cells that are beneath the surface of the skin. Um, so now to kind of start, um, I wanna begin with an overview of how colonization has targeted the sense of smell. Um, olfactory colonization works in two interconnected ways. First, the kind of uh, philosophy and ideology of deodorization, which I'm sure we're all familiar with, um, invalidating the sense of smell um, as a sense that's too embodied, subjective, and instinctual to kind of qualify as a mode of knowledge and also a mode of aesthetics. Um, but secondly, related to that is the transformation of already existing smellscapes, right? So, um, I'll give a couple of examples of that later, but I just want to point out for now that those two uh, modes are interconnected. So it's much easier to transform smellscapes when you've disqualified smell as, you know, a valid source of knowledge and experience. Okay, so throughout the world, colonization has eroded indigenous people's vital olfactory modes of relationship, knowledge, spirituality, and environmental connection. Just a few examples of these include the honey, so the oceanic nose crest greeting that Westerners have long disparaged, the use of smell in traditional oceanic navigation. So for example, using the smell of winds from certain islands um, to find one's place in the open sea, or the ch uh, Chamoru belief that the sudden, quote, the sudden whiff of certain smells, especially of flowers where none are found, is understood to be a sign of otherworldly presence. That's quoting the scholar Vicente Diaz. Um, the Kanaka Maoli or native Hawaiian poet and critic Brandy Nalani McDougall 
notes that understanding indigenous specific poetry demands more attention to smell in this quote. Um, thinking of aesthetics in terms of ala or fragrance would quote, allow us to make textual, cultural and historical connections and associations grounded in legacy and memory to actively genealogize layers of meaning across contexts and to think about these intellectual challenges as pleasurable. So just a couple examples of how olfactory colonization has changed indigenous smellscapes. Here are two building designs. There's the uh, indigenous Samoan Fale, um, I think also popular like throughout Oceania, um, an open air thatch hut, and then a uh, um, beach resort in Samoa, right? And you can just kind of imagine the different kinds of olfactory experience that each one would involve. Um, the Samoan uh, writer and poet Albert Went, um, who, by the way, is on the right here. <laughs> um, I, I don't know if you can see him. But anyways, um, Albert Went characterizes these hotels that had been cropping up all over the Pacific as air-conditioned coffins. Um, okay, so next, there, this is Sarnia, Ontario, where about 40% of Canada's entire national petro petrochemical industry is concentrated onto 15 square miles of land and it's also um, proximate to a settlement of the settlement of um, the Amjunang band of Ojibwe Indians or at First Peoples um, and the anthropologist Deborah Jackson has done some work on the olfactory experience of folks living in Sarnia and how how they kind of perceive these smells as alienating um, on various levels. So next I want to just kind of introduce the term um, from the introduced by the Southern Paiute anthropologist Kristen Simmons, um, settler atmospherics, right? And she's drawing this from the way that tear gas, temperature, so the cold and water cannons, helicopters, and just the kind of general atmosphere of terror were used at the uh, Dakota Access Pipeline protests to kind of instill an affective mood, right, that of kind of um, basically terror and to maintain and to maintain and I, you could even think curate that mood, something like the opposite of the white cube. Um, another kind of prominent example that many of you probably know about is the uh, Israeli Defense Forces use and testing without consent of skunk water primarily on Palestinians since 2008. Skunk water is this like disgustingly smelling weaponized fluid. Um, okay, so settler atmospherics, let me just say one more thing about settler atmospherics, which is that it really draws attention to thinking about settler colonialism as something that kind of depends on being able to transform smellscapes, right? Both over the long term, say with like monocrop agriculture or with um, the introduction of new species, but also in these kind of weaponized contexts of counterinsurgency. Um, meanwhile, the use of smudging, so indigenous um, smudging rituals has been criminalized or prohibited on numerous occasions in homes and college dormitories or here at a political rally. Um, so just kind of thinking about smudging as a way to kind of assert some degree of sovereignty or power over one's atmosphere. Um, okay, so let me just find my place for a second. Now I wanna to turn to two writers, two indigenous writers who have been responding to olfactory colonization by thinking with smell um, and by working to decolonize smell. So um, Haunani Tre. Kay Trask, sorry, is a Hawaiian scholar, poet, and activist who often showcases colonials, colonialism's olfactory violence, which she calls in this quote, I won't read the whole quote, um, the stench of colonialism. So I'll just read a few parts of it. The stench of colonialism is everywhere. She talks about Waikiki, where human excrement from the overloaded Honolulu sewer system floats just offshore at the Honolulu airport where jet fuel from airplanes creates an eternal pall in the still hot air in the magnificent valleys and plains of all major islands where pesticide and herbicide use on sugar plantations and mammoth golf courses, um, et cetera, et cetera. In her poems, Trask writes of a landscape and also an indigenous population suffocated by, quote, strange unscented trees from Asia and the Middle East, 
Um, she also writes of wealthy Japanese tourists, quote, smelling of greasy perfume, tanning with the stench of empire. And she writes of, quote, a fragrance of devouring emitted by the ongoing US occupation. So Trask's framing of colonialism as a corrupted atmosphere builds on the profound significance of air in Kanaka Maoli religion and political theory. Her olfactory language is, is informed by the interconnected definitions of the term ea in Hawaiian language and culture. Pukui and Elbert's Hawaiian dictionary notes that ea can denote sovereignty and independence, as well as life, air, breath, gas, fumes, breeze, spirit, and smell. Ea is at once a material and political concept that blends air, sovereignty, and vitality. But it also encompasses atmospheric emissions, um, exhaust fumes, I think about a quarter of the way, or right here, I don't know if you can see the arrow, but maybe a third of the way down, and olfactory communication, so to smell, which is the last definition under number four there. The olfactory implications of ea provoke questions that would be unimaginable to Western thinkers who typically envision sovereignty as inodorate. What is the smell of Hawaiian sovereignty, and how can that smell be recuperated from colonialism's differential differentially deodorized and polluted atmospheres. So Trask doesn't just criticize colonialism's to toxic smells. She also offers lyrical accounts of indigenous scents like this one. Um, and I'm gonna just kind of note that there's a lot of indigenous terms, Hawaiian terms um, in this stanza, but many of the definitions are provided um, in Trask's glossary, which is excerpted below. So I'll read the quote, to breathe the aqua, lehua and makani, pua and la'i, maili and palai, pungent kino lao, to sense the ancients. So aqua, according to the glossary, refers to God, supernatural or divine. Trask's lines gloss the idea of breathing divinity with a catalog of scented forms, lehua or the flower of the ohia tree, makani, a wind or breeze, pua, a flower, la'i, a tea leaf, Maili and Palai, both native Hawaiian plants important to the hula. Um, the pungent kino lao in the stanza's last line refers to the many forms taken by a god. Here, kinship is both genealogical and material. All forms of life are descended from the gods according to Hawaiian cosmogonies. And at the same time, breath sustains and breath is sustained by direct and ongoing connection with the ancients. Underscoring the pungent scent of Kino Lao, Trask conceives of the divine not only in connection with worldly forms, but as a transcorporeal atmosphere that inhabits and transforms bodies through breath. Alerting us to the varied sense that the shape-shifting gods take on in the material world, the phrase pungent Kino Lao directs us to read the sensuous olfactory descriptions of sea winds, miley vines, volcanic smoke, and rock musk scattered throughout Trask's poems, um, and this is from her book of poetry, Night is a Sharkskin Drum, by the way. As decolonial moments devoted to indigenous smells that have been alternately suppressed and or commodified under settler colonialism. These scents revivify indigenous cosmologies whose stories, um, sensations, and material contexts have been eroded by settler colonialism's environmental and educational impositions. Um, so the next example, last example, in her collection of essays, Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants, the Potawatomi environmental biologist, Robin Wall Kimmerer, explores how smell might be decolonized through material practice, through simple, carefully contextualized activities like smudging, harvesting, and seeding indigenous plants. Um, in this quote, from the book's preface, Kimmerer suggests that both the Western botanical name and the Potawatomi name for sweetgrass recognize the plant's spiritual significance. Hold the bundle up to your nose, find the fragrance of honeyed vanilla over the scent of river water and black earth, and you understand its scientific name, Cura Chloe Odorata, meaning fragrant holy grass. In our language, it is called Lingashk, the sweet smelling hair of mother earth. Breathe it in and you start to remember things you didn't know you'd forgotten. Um, the name Wingashk goes further than the Latin name, recognizing kinship relations with both the plant and the earth. The smell of sweetgrass isn't just a path to individual memories, as with Proust's famous Madeleine example. 
Here, the things you didn't know you'd forgotten reach across generations to ways of relating to the earth and its non-human plants that have been decimated by colonialism. Kimmerer later shows how this forgetting of the spiritual, medicinal, and cultural importance of sweetgrass was a product of the Native American residential school system, in her case of an ancestor's colonial education at the Carlisle Indian Industrial School. The more or less compulsory colonial education of indigenous children, which involved moving them far from the lands and ecologies they knew and the smellscapes they knew, um, and among other things, forcing them into Western regimes of deodorization, targeted indigenous modes of knowledge and relation for destruction. So in a chapter of her book that I don't have time to discuss in detail, Kimmerer spends time replanting sweetgrass at a contemporary Anishinaabe settlement designed to revivify forgotten Anishinaabe traditions, a settlement whose goal is to enact, quote, Carlisle in reverse. Um, here's another way in which scent reverses the agenda of Carlisle. Kimmerer gathers at one point with a group of other survivors of the Indian school at the school's cemetery in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Um, here at one of the epicenters of cult cultural genocide, Carlisle was the first and most notorious of the schools, um, survivors from multiple indigenous nations purify the air with the smells of sweetgrass and sage. Um, so I'll read this quote, the scent of burning sage and sweetgrass wraps the small crowd in prayer Sweetgrass is a healing medicine, a smudge that invokes kindness and compassion coming as it does from our first mother. The sacred words of healing rose up around us. Stolen children, lost bonds, the burden of loss hangs in the air and mingles with the scent of sweetgrass. Wrapping the crowd in prayer, sweetgrass binds these descendants representing numerous indigenous nations into a single group. It evokes compassion even at the sight of immeasurable atrocities as its scent mingles with both the burden of loss and the human and non-human exhalations already in the air. This fragrance doesn't heal bodies individually so much as it restores lost bonds, drawing the senses back to reciprocal social and environmental relationships, um, the small crowd and our first mother, or Earth. Here, the question of whose memories are supported by the smellscape turns out to be inextricably entangled with whose physical, mental, and spiritual well being it sustains. Like Trask's poetry, Braiding Sweetgrass shows how the smell of indigenous plants, employed by indigenous artists and authors, calls for multiple modes of engagement from personal healing to cultural and political resurgence. So, I just have a couple of quick kind of takeaway conclusions. Um, Smell first has served as a powerful tool for colonization and decolonization. Secondly, decolonizing smell would require engaging with indigenous authorities and contexts for smell and supporting indigenous sovereignty over ancestral land and air. Um, and then finally, uh, indigenous practices like hula, smudging, and even weaving baskets with sweetgrass should be recognized as forms of olfactory aesthetics that orient people's social, ecological, and spiritual relations in complex and powerful ways. Um, so that's it for the talk. And I'm excited to hear what you all think um, either in the next 10 minutes or feel free to email me after. Thank you, Sean, um, very much for a really uh, moving and well-researched, obviously, uh, presentation and um, timely. So we're getting a lot of comments. Um, Donna says, that was excellent. Jazz says, fantastic, incredible, wonderful. And we have a question. Um, okay, James uh, wants, to, uh, wants to know, can you give the name of the experience of smelling a flower or a spirit? The name of ex um, Yeah, James, do you, wanna, do you want to ask that live? Let me, let me hang on a sec. Let me find you and, and give, you, give you voice. Um, James. You should be able to ask your question now. Am I unmuted now? Yes, you are. Is my head invisible, I hope? Yes, it is. Oh, you had mentioned the experience of a person. Uh, I don't know exactly who it was. It was an indigenous person who would have an experience of a sudden floral fragrance, which was a signal that a spirit was there. What, could yeah. you? So. I'm gonna just type it because it's a reference. Um, oh, good, thank you. Uh, 
that helpful. I don't remember the exact name of the article, but there's two pieces he's written on oceanic uh, olfactory traditions. One is called Smelling Oceania's, Oceania's Behind, and it's about fart jokes. <laughs> but it's actually like really interesting. Like it's a kind of a reflection on historiography. The other one, I'm forgetting the name of the other article, but it's in one of those. Wait, where did you type it? In the chat or? In the chat, but James, I'll find it for you because I think it's, okay, it's Vicente Diaz writing about Chamorro olfactory beliefs. Let me read. Okay. Copy, paste it, and pop it back yeah, in. Yeah, but I don't know if he gives the actual, or even if there is a specific term for that experience, but it is fascinating, right? The smell of flowers where none are seen. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of my jam because it's a spiritualist thing where people in seances have that too. <laughs> oh, wow. Thanks. So, um, which reminds me, James will be speaking tomorrow, so, and he'll be talking about spiritualism in the sense. So if you're curious about that, uh, Sean. Um, Jasmine uh, has a question, and Jasmine, I'm going to go ahead and promote you to ask directly as well. Hang on, just give me one second. Um, it's kind of more fun when people get to ask directly. Mm -hmm. So Jasmine, are you ready? I'm going to unmute you here. Hang on. Okay, Jasmine. Hello, Are thank you. you. Yeah, hello, thank you. Your presentation was amazing. I really, I really went through such a deep and, uh, you know, spiritual uh, experience through the words and, and all the narrative that you went through. So you mentioned about the traditional nose rubbing greeting that you said that existed in the indigenous cultures or something that was eradicated. Could you a little talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so it's a, it's a um, fairly common greeting among I, I believe, I don't know why I say all, but at least many indigenous oceanic um, nations. So um, Samoa is where Albert Went is from. And in that image, I don't know if you could see it because I think the column of our faces might have blocked it on Zoom, but um, he's doing the, it's called the Honey. Um, so it's rubbing noses basically, but this has been viewed largely as, you know, at least a partially olfactory greeting where you're sharing breath with the person whom you're greeting. And that, of course, is also why Westerners and missionaries have long opposed to it, been opposed to it because they've seen it as, you know, kind of improper to share breath with someone upon greeting them. Well, I've actually been you. very curious, sorry, I've been very curious if there are discourses around it um, during COVID, actually. No, thank you. I live in Oman, actually, and in Oman, everybody greets like the Arabs greet other Arabs with the nose rubbing, mm -hmm. you know. And so I, I thought that was a little strange until I, you know, I, I found out that it is a very traditional indigenous, you know, part of the culture to do that. And men do that with other men and men kiss other men. So <laughs> there is a lot of, uh, like you said, olfactory exchange and breath exchange. And yeah. And just as a quick <laughs> footnote to that. Um, I was reading actually that um, one of the things that people unconsciously do within 15 seconds of shaking someone's hand, someone's hand is smelling your hand. So whether we like it or not, we're kind of doing it anyways. Um, Rachel uh, has a question. So Rachel, I've promoted you and I, I think you have your babe, but I'm going to unmute you for a second. Great. Yeah. Hi. Hey. Um, hey, this is I thought you might have some interesting insight on this. Um, how do we walk the fine line with encouraging people to educate themselves about spiritual indigenous practices without encouraging the appropriation of things like sweet grass or Palo Santo that are intended to be used ceremonially but are now so widespread, particularly looking at Christian Dior released a fragrance last year called Savage or Savage, which is a raci racist term. Yeah. And part of our passion as perfumers is learning about other cultures. So it's, how do you feel it's best to walk that line to not appropriate, but to celebrate? Right. Well, I mean, I think the I'm, I'm in a kind of uncomfortable position, right, as a settler who is writing about this. My own approach to it, I mean, as the literary scholar, <laughs> critic is to like focus much more on citing and trying to understand what indigenous authors are doing rather than doing my usual kind of like critical like slicing analysis. Um, I think that I mean my sense would be a like to ask indigenous authorities rather than me right and this is something that I 
I've been doing some, but should be doing much more. Um, and then also just to be sure that what, like folks are working with indigenous authorities, collaborating, working in like particular like contexts, right? So exactly like not to commodify things. I mean, I see like urban outfitters, I'm just guessing, but they probably sell sweetgrass or stores like that. And then white college students or settler college students can burn those in their elite dorms with no problem. Meanwhile, indigenous students who are burning them in their dorms have been stopped for doing so, right? For smudging um, because it's seen as a fire hazard. So these, I mean, it's partly about these restrictions being differentially enforced, but I think really being like thinking about questions of olfactory sovereignty, right? And who, who gets to determine the smells around them or the smells around us? Um, and olfactory sovereignty is something that's of course very much connected to sovereignty over land as well. Um, so I think basically supporting indigenous sovereignty and connecting projects to the support of indigenous sovereignty would be the way, the way to do that. But I don't, I don't have specific kind of recommendations over how, how to do it in specific contexts. Yeah. Thanks for the question. I'm going to combine two questions, um, one from Eddie Baliki and one from Donna Lipowitz. Um, so Eddie's question is, what are your suggestions for the protection of lost olfactory heritage? Museums, archives, reintroduction, pedagogical programs, something else? And how do you decide which smells to save? And then Donna's question is similar. Is there any evidence of attempts to mend or rehabilitate these smell abused, could we call it that? indigenous communities. Mm -hmm. Sorry, is there any attempt to, I missed the last part. Oh, mend or rehabilitate these smell abused indigenous communities. Oh, okay, yeah. So thanks for the questions. I mean, the first one, again, I think uh, I wouldn't be the person to ask, but like, I think museums and other cultural institutions really need to be collaborating with indigenous authorities and indigenous artists, indigenous curators, especially. Um, on these questions of like how to preserve. Um, I know that I was reading a bit about smudging of artifacts actually, and a couple of museums in the US um, have, have been doing just this and like consulting with indigenous authorities um, and actually smudging objects instead of um, preserving them in these like completely deodorized climates because smudging actually protects um, from, you know, things like certain pests Etc. Right. So it actually does pr preserve objects in certain kinds of ways that are different from what the white cube might otherwise do. Um, so allowing and actually enabling those kinds of um, practices, I think, is key. Can Canadian institutions, I I've been working in Canada this last year, I think they've been much more active in these kinds of collaborations. So I think looking at things coming out of Canada, just because there's a lot more kind of recognition and funding and energy behind um, what they call truth and recon reconciliation, right, over settler colonial genocide um, here in Canada. So I don't know, those would be some places to look. In terms of like attempts to uh, kind of do reparations for these kinds of like olfactory damaged communities, um, I would recommend Robin Wall Kimmerer's chapter um, on, I'm forgetting the title of the chapter, so you can email me, I'll send it to you, but where she writes about going to this um, settlement of Anishinaabe, primarily Anishinaabe people who are trying to re-educate uh, children in Anishinaabe cultures, and she goes there and plants sweetgrass all along the river side with them, right? Um, in order to kind of um, basically produce more, like, sorry, to repair the sweetgrass population that used to be there. And she explains like how various aspects of settler colonialism have changed the soil so that sweetgrass could not flourish, but that, you know, as a plant scientist, she's able to kind of um, address and uh, ameliorate these things. Yeah, so that's one example. I'm uh, bringing Yosha to, to, Yosha has a complicated question that 
should be asked directly. So Yosh, do you want to ask your questions of Sean? Sure. Um, hi, Sean. That that's, was a really amazing presentation. Thank you so much. My, my mind is like going a mile a minute now. But um, what do you think about um, smell prejudice that's contemporary and current? Like I, I saw that David Chang, who's a restaurateur from you know, Momofuku in New York, he recently posted that his landlord is withholding his future security deposit because of all the smells coming out of his house. And of course, he's like one of our most famous uh, Asian American chefs on the planet right now. And his freaking landlord doesn't want him. Uh, it's like a future security deposit, right? And then also because, um, uh, you know, my radar is up. I also saw in a separate post something about smell prejudice and lots of police officers stopping people, mostly black people, um, for the scent of marijuana coming out of wafting out of their, you know, bodies, cars, whatever. And so, you know, there's, there's just like, what, is there any insights that you have on current smell prejudice and yeah. what um, we can do that about question. Yeah. I mean, I think I could say a couple of things uh, that will probably sound like shameless plugs for my book, but mm -hmm. so I do have a chapter on um, detective fiction and largely detective mm -hmm. fiction that's about race. Um, where uh, the detective, I'm, I'm interested in the trope of like the detective's nose, right? And like the detective being on the scent of things. Um, so like Sherlock Holmes at one point, he confronts like a black sort of like bouncer figure and, the, and he reaches for his scent bottle and the black, the bouncer thinks he's reaching for his gun, but he's like, no, I'm just reaching for my scent bottle because I don't want to smell you, right? So these kinds of moments, but then also black detective fiction. Um, so there's, a couple pieces by Rudolf Fischer and by uh, Chester Himes that uh, really mobilize olfaction and this idea about black smells um, and criminalize black smells in really interesting critical ways. So thinking about like ventilation access, right? And like overcrowding, um, blaming the landlord, speaking of David Chang, right? So like, all of the ways in which landlords and capitalism are responsible actually for the bad smells of Harlem. Um, so that would be one place to look. Another chapter that I have is called Atmo Orientalism. And that's really looking at the specific strain of anti-Asian olfactory prejudice that goes way back to like um, epidemics like cholera and other kinds of disease anxieties in San Francisco and other Western Chinatowns. Um, in the 19th century. So just really quickly, because it's related, I think, to COVID in various ways, there, uh, San Francisco passed the cubic air ordinance that basically restricted people to living, like basically people had to have a certain amount of cubic air around each person in their living space. And this was like completely um, enforced only against Chinese, right? Um, so it was trying to, uh, criminalize the Chinese and denigrate the Chinese as prone to kind of atmospheric diseases and atmospheric contagion. But there's also a long discourse about bad Chinese smells. Um, and David Chang is this one example. I could give you a lot of examples of, I mean, like the uh, sriracha sauce, right? They, there's a similar kind of complaint against their factory. Um, there's the Thai temple in Berkeley whose neighbors like complained about smells and tried to get them shut down. So. And then if you look, meanwhile, at like pizza restaurants that have wood stoves or like the bagel restaurants in Montreal that have been around for a long time, um, there have been the occasional complaints, but those get shut down almost immediately. So one, um, I'll, I'll actually jot down a quick citation here. Hang on. Um, that article, is fantastic. It's about uh, the use of smell to shut down squid fishing in Monterey, California, whereas the smells of fish fishing um, by like white fishermen was seen as like part of the town's tradition, right, and something that should not be shut down. So squid fishing was done by Chinese fishermen in Monterey. Oh, it went only to the panelists. Sorry. It's okay. Um, I got it. I got it, okay. Sean. Keep talking. Yeah, and I guess the last thing I'd say about olfactory prejudice, and this isn't, I mean, to kind of put folks who think about olfactory art, and this is completely including myself on the spot, 
um, is the way in which practices like smudging don't really register as aesthetic practices, right? So I've been writing, for example, about um, the artist Renee Stout, who is interested in like conjure traditions, and, which use a lot of like herbs and roots, and she has some olfactory elements in her work. But that doesn't get seen as kind of avant-garde olfactory art, even though I think in many ways it should be, right? And it's actually registering the ways in which like black people in everyday contexts have used smell as a means of survival, as a means of kind of um, what, what borrowing from Peter Sloterdijk, I call air conditioning, right? Air conditioning from below is kind of my term for it. So Sean, thank you so much for, for lending your time uh, and your research. And I know you've been working on this for many, many, many years. So it's nice mm -hmm. to see it all coming to, to fruition. Thanks.